Well, let's try that again. It's good to see each one of you. We are glad you're here this week. Welcome back to Surfside. Of all weeks, we decided to go back to our in-person service. And then a hurricane. You know, so what's funny is there are people, you probably didn't know this, there are people who are actually disappointed when the hurricanes don't hit. You know what those people are called? Non-homeowners. That's what those are called. <laughs> You see, anybody owns the house, like, please, I don't feel like cleaning up anything. So uh, it does look like it's dissipating quite a bit, but we still will not have service in the morning just to be safe. We, we tend to err on the side of safety. We try to find that balance always of, of courage and common sense. And yet uh, it's like uh, faith and foolishness is always the balance that we strive for. Tonight we're going to talk about what do, we, what do you do or what to do when you are helpless. What to do when you're helpless. And we're going to be looking in Mark chapter 5, and we're going to talk about three keys to facing helplessness with faith. And of course, Liddell and Elijah are going to help me tonight uh, uh, all the way from China. And uh, you guys won't watch this till, maybe you'll tune in like in the middle of this, because I think it's 6 a.m. Uh, uh, on Sunday morning. So you're going to tune in in like three hours. But anyway, um, so when I, now this is a girl's, I don't know how this ended up at my house. This is a uh, uh, fairy princess, Disney fairy princess ball. This is not my ball. Bob Smith, if you were watching, this is not my ball. But anyway, so when I was a little kid, I, so I remember two things. On the way here tonight, I was listening to Triumph. Do you remember that band? Very 80s band. A, a Triumph song came, I had it on kind of a random mix and... And a triumph song came on, and all of a sudden, in my mind, I remembered being 17 years of age, uh, listening to this song. It's called Magic Power. It, by the way, to young people, it sounds like ancient, archaic music. But, but hearing this song, Magic Power, just, just I remember being 17 in Miami with my mullet, convertible Mustang, my non-skip CD player sitting on the dash of my car with the adapter that went into my tape player. I'm totally dating myself. Hey, I had the non-skip one though, so it only skipped every three days, but three, three minutes. But anyway, you had the non-skip and it would skip a minute after you hit a bump. Do you remember all that stuff? And I remember those times driving that car and listening to music and cranking up. And all of a sudden, for the first time in your life, you felt like you were in control. But how many people know here that you're really not as in control as you think you are, right? When we talk about helplessness, we tend to think of it about how we feel. But the truth is, we don't control a lot of things in life. There's very few things that we can control. Even if you get the remote and you're turning channels, if anybody else is in the room, they're complaining about you staying on a channel too long or not turning it fast enough or not staying long enough on that channel. You just can't win. One of my first memories of helplessness as a child, I was probably three or four years old. The reason I know that is because my brother was with me and he was being carried and he's only a little over a year younger than me. I believe we were at, my mom and I actually talked about this today because I believe we were at uh, Chimney Rock. And there's a place in Chimney Rock where, I, where you go up uh, to the top and you go back and forth. And I was a little kid and I had a ball with me. And, and I don't know if a gust of wind came up or if I was playing around or whatever, but I lost the ball and it went bouncing down the mountain. And it was like all I had with me was this ball. I didn't care about walking where we were going. You know, I wasn't thinking, oh, look at the beautiful mountain. I mean, that's, you know, if you're three and four years old, you really could care less. What do you care about? What's in your hand, right? And all of a sudden it was gone. And of course, I was upset. I, I don't remember crying. I'm sure I did. But I also remember my dad saying, I'll be back. He didn't say it like Arnold Schwarzenegger. That was before Arnold Schwarzenegger. But, uh, but my dad actually went down to look for it and found it and came back up and handed me the ball again. He had found it. But for just a few moments, I had total, there was nothing I could do. My favorite toy in that moment was gone. There was nothing I could do about it. And here's what I know about that feeling. 
I've had that feeling thousands of times since then. And you're going to have feelings of helplessness sometimes. Your feeling of helplessness may come when the doctor tells you something about you. Your feeling of helplessness may come when the doctor tells you something about someone you care about. Your feeling of helplessness may come when the phone rings in the middle of the night. And it's a call you didn't want to hear. Your feeling of hopelessness might come when the boss walks in and says something to you. Your feeling of helplessness might come just because you can't even control your own impulses and addictions sometimes. And that chocolate has to get out of your refrigerator. Right? I don't know what's going to cause you to feel helpless. Maybe it's because of somebody you care about, something happening to them. It could be that something that's going on with you is what's bothering you. And it could just be that the demons in your life are haunting you and you don't have control. In Mark chapter 5, we're going to look at three different stories of three different people who needed Jesus. And here's what I want to tell you. This is, this is very simple, okay? Here's the lesson that's all through chapter 5. If you feel helpless, <laughs> if you feel in charge, you, no matter what, I want you to learn to make your first response to cry out to Jesus. No, no matter what's going on, if things are going great, and I mean, you're looking and you're like, man, my life, is just, I just, I, I got things under control. I just got this or this is just, I got my new ball and it's going really great here today. I got my mullet, right? I got rid of my COVID mullet. I went and got my hair cut. So Daryl got rid of all mullets. I want you to learn to cry out to Jesus regardless of whether you feel in charge or whether you feel weak. But this is a great message for people who are feeling helpless because all three groups in this story felt helpless. And the first thing we're going to talk about is facing the spiritual battle. Now, now there's two problems with talking about demons. And I'll tell you what they are. Number one is there's people who go, ah, I don't believe in any of that stuff. That never happens. And then other people who, after you talk about demons, call the pastor in the middle of the night and go, listen, um, I, was, I was in the kitchen and the lights flickered. I think it was Satan. Okay? So both of those people are crazy. They're just different crazies, right? And so I want you to realize that you are but regardless of how you feel right now, you are always dealing with a spiritual battle. And so you need to be aware of it and what it looks like. And I'm going to give you, because we don't always see the spiritual battle, I'm even in the middle, I'm going to give you just a few ways to look based on this guy. Here it is. Night and day, we're picking up uh, uh, this chapter here in verse, uh, forgive me because I spread my notes out, in verse 5, Okay. Uh, um, it tells about Jesus landing and Jesus, this guy comes out of the tombs. Um, he's, he's on the cliffs. Uh, by the way, you can still go to this city and visit. And uh, uh, he comes out of the tombs where he's living. And by the way, um, uh, Luke tells us that there's two people there. That doesn't mean there's not one person there. Every once in a while somebody says, well, there was a conflict uh, in the story. No, remember, this is the Cliff Notes version. And so, and so uh, Mark is trying to tell us the main part of the story, which is about this one guy. Night and day among the tombs and in the hills, listen to this, he would cry out and cut himself. Can I tell you something about when you're in a spiritual battle? You don't sleep well. People who are in a spiritual battle also hurt themselves. Because I've dealt with suicide in other in family members and other people. I can tell you right now that every single time that I've dealt with somebody who is contemplating suicide, that it is a spiritual battle also. Don't negate. Yes, it may be psychological. I understand that. Yes, it might be physical. You may have an imbalance. I understand that. But it doesn't mean that it's not also spiritual. Okay? Don't be a person that says, well, because it might be this, it can't be that. You are not Tupperware. It can be both. So, so recognize that it may be a spiritual battle. He, he, he cut himself, and in the Greek, this word means he gashed himself. He, he, many theologians think that he was trying to take his life in order to get relief from the demons. The pigs felt the same way. Jesus later on sends them into pigs. And guess what the pigs do? They kill themselves. They're like, we're not dealing with this. And they're gone. 
when he saw Jesus from a distance, listen to what he did. He ran and fell on his knees in front of him. And he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the highest God? I love this. In God's name, don't torture me. Isn't that awesome? He says to God, in God's name, don't torture me. Now notice what a spiritual battle looks like. It drives people away from other people. People who are going through a spiritual battle push other people away. It creates angry, anguish in your heart. Uh, you may be able to put on a good face for everybody that you're doing just fine. But a spiritual battle, it's like wringing hands inside all the time. It's amazing sometimes you can know you're in a spiritual battle. Why? Because you have the energy to do something mean or to hurt somebody else. And we all know somebody who can, has the energy to hurt somebody else, but they don't have energy for anything good. All they have energy for is something bad. And by the way, we've all fallen into that. Haven't you ever been tired and then you get mad about something and it motivates you? That's not real good. We tend to hurt ourselves and others. The worst thing about spiritual battles is if we don't deal with them, it will drive us from God. See, Satan wants you to be in hell. That's his goal for you. And not just in eternity. He wants you to be in hell today. He, he wants you to be tormented all the time. And if you know someone who is struggling, whether it's with addiction or with depression or something else, I'm telling you, it's not just emotional or physical. Pay attention to the spiritual. And what do you do? Cry out to God. God, would you help my friend? God, would you relieve my friend from the anguish they're suffering? You need to realize that when that person attacks you and you notice they attack everybody, it could just be, it could just be that it's not just them, that there is a spiritual battle going on inside of them. Now, I don't think that you should necessarily look at them and go, come out or, or the, Christ of, the, the power of Christ compels you or whatever. But I definitely think you should pray for people. And here's what I think too. When you're a discerning person, you can sense sometimes, you know what? That's not like them. I'm going to start praying that God's blood would cleanse them, that he would take care of them, that his angels would protect them. Because we all know somebody who all of a sudden we're like, something's not right. Pray for those people. God is greater. Did you know in James 2.19, the Bible says that Satan knows, the demons know that God is greater. They know it. They know it. And so you don't have to sit in fear. You don't have to be afraid. Don't watch scary movies all the time. Let yourself get freaked out. Know that God is stronger than all of those things. And then it continues. When they came to Jesus. So this is later on in the story. Remember Jesus basically sends the demons away. They go into the pigs. The pigs run off the cliff. And so the people didn't want them there. It's another story. When they came to Jesus. They saw the man who had been possessed by the legion of demons sitting there. Dressed. By the way, Luke tells us that the guy wasn't even clothed. So what does that mean? He wasn't even taking care of himself. If you ever meet somebody and you realize that they're doing self-destructive behavior, I can tell you right now that the enemy loves that. And so pray for them. Yes, they may have an addiction and need help and need counseling. They may have psychological issues and need medicine and, and need a doctor and maybe even need to be in a center for a little bit of time. I get all that, but pray for them also. Don't leave out the spiritual aspect of what they're dealing with. So he's sitting there, he's dressed and in his right mind. That would be a first for me. And they, listen to this, the people, they were afraid. The guy gets his act together and everybody's like, whoa, that's not normal. We're not used to that. Those who'd seen it told the people what had happened to the demon-possessed man and they told about the pigs. Then the people, listen to this, began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. I could do a whole sermon on that sentence. I'm not going to talk about it tonight, but just put that one in your hopper there for a minute. As Jesus was getting into the boat, I love this, the man who'd been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus didn't let him, but said, go home to your people, tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So let me tell you what happens when God restores you spiritually. You all of a sudden have peace with God. You have peace with yourself. Do you, do you have peace with yourself right now? You have peace with other people. You take care of yourself. You find energy to do God's will. The guy goes running and says, hey, I want to go with you. And they're like, no, no, go tell all the people around you what God's done. 
All of a sudden, you have energy to do God's will. This guy had been up day and night screaming all night. Can you imagine what it was like to live in town and hear that guy? This was before air conditioning. You could hear that guy screaming all night long, night after night. And now here he was sitting going, how can I help you? And then finally, you are grateful. By the way, one of the things I know this about the enemy is when the enemy attacks you, one of the things he hates is when you're grateful. So if you find you're struggling with getting depressed and discouraged and you're getting your mind on yourself and you're frustrated and you're helpless, take time to be grateful. Here's your first prayer tonight. Father, help me to recognize the spiritual battles. Because we need to realize that not everything is physical. Some things are. Listen, some of you, you're tired, and so you're grumpy. It's not a demon. It's a lack of sleep. You know, some of you have been eating garbage. You ate four pounds of sugar before you got here, and all of a sudden the sugar drops. And you're like, I don't know, I just feel terrible. I think it's Satan. No, it's milkshake, right? And so, Father, help me to recognize the spiritual battles. So, so when you wake up and you've had a dream and the dream bothers you, you say, Lord, is, is that dream, is it because of the enemy? And God may say, pepperoni pizza. You know, you, you, you can't, I cannot eat Dairy Queen before I go to bed. I can tell you that right now because I'll have the wildest dreams. I'll wake up going, in Jesus' name, leave the room, right? It's sugar. So what do you do? You pray, God, make me discerning. Help me to know the spiritual battle around me. Not to focus on the spiritual battle, not to focus on the enemy, but to be aware that there's more than what we see going on. Number two, face the past with righteous action. Now, I have taught this story, I don't even know how many times in the last 25 years. And as I'm looking at it this time, I realize I'm sure this woman was ready to give up. I'm sure the woman in this story had tried to get help, tried to get help, tried to get help. And I am sure there's days that she woke up and said, no more. But for whatever reason, she decided one more time. And this time I'm going to Jesus. You know what's hard in life? Is when you're not getting better. To not get bitter. It's very hard when things are not getting better to not get bitter. Because you keep praying, you keep wanting God to do something, and things get worse. And this woman, listen to this story. A woman was there who had been subject to bleeding, listen, 12 years of torture. She had suffered a great deal. This in the Greek, this idea is, is, is torture. It's horrible. Back then, the, the medicine was nowhere like it is now. They were just trying stuff on her for 12 years. And she had spent all that she had. So I'm sure in the middle of that, some of the doctors were shysters. She, she got some car, used car salesmen in there, right? I can take care of you. Let me just, let me just you, you need to pay a little bit extra for this, and I'll, we'll take care of this, and we'll do this, and give me some more money. Until she didn't have any more money left either. So not only is she exhausted from what's happening to her physically, she's also out of money. And instead of getting better, she got worse. Can you cry out to Jesus when things get worse after you pray for them to get better? For 12 years, this woman prayed to get better. She looked for all kind of ways to get better and just got worse, but she never got better. What'd she do? She took the next step. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak. Because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. She had so much faith that she didn't even want to... By the way, by the way, she was considered unclean. She was not allowed to go to the temple. She was not allowed to go and have prayers together. She was not allowed to go and make sacrifices. She was not allowed to be around other people. Uh, 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 strict Jews would not even sit anywhere near her. She was isolated. So what'd she do? She said, if I just sneak up and I, and I touch him, I mean, I probably can't talk to him, but if I just touch him, I'll be healed. I love this. Immediately her bleeding stopped and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. Immediately, boom. Why? Because of her faith. We're gonna talk about that in a second. 
At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. Oh, goodness, there's 12 doctoral papers on that right there. What does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. I don't know. Can I tell you why I don't know? Because there's a huge debate about what it means. Does it mean that when she touched him, actual power went out of Jesus and he had to use power to heal her? Probably. Does it mean that because her faith was so strong, it was like she extracted power from him? I, I don't know. Does it? I have no idea. But Jesus felt that she touched him and he knew something was going on. Isn't it awesome that all you have to do is get close to Jesus? To be healed, to be touched, for him to change you. By the way, that's why it's important for some of you to be around friends who aren't Christians. Because you'll get them closer to Jesus than they'll ever be. And it could be that God just does a miracle in their life because of you. So he turns around in the crowd and says, who touched my clothes? Which I love the disciples. We find out later. The disciples are basically like, uh, there's a lot of people here. Uh, we don't really know. Then the woman, a few verses later, knowing what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet and trembling with fear. Listen to this. She told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter. By the way, what that means, he, if he told her, she told about 12 years of suffering. She told about what she had been through. She gave a testimony right there in front of everybody. And then he says this. Daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be free from your suffering. If you're not careful, your past will hold you back from doing what God wants you to do next. 12 years of suffering. And she tried one more time. 12 years of going to people and asking for help and being ripped off. And she said, one more. It could just be that the next time God asks you to step out in faith, that that's what he's going to use to heal you. Whether it's spiritual, emotional, physical, maybe it's somebody you're praying for. But God, I want to step out in faith one more time. Here's your second prayer. Father, help me to do what's right when I'm hurting. By the way, most people don't want to do what God wants them to when they don't feel good. A lot of pastors confess to me all the time that they're on the way to church and they thought about driving the other way. They don't feel good, either spiritually, emotionally, physically. You ever feel like not going to work? Anybody in here ever feel like not going to work? Anybody, anybody in here on the way to work and you think, I just don't want to go? Did you know, as much as I love our congregation and I love our people, did you know there's days and nights that I'm on the way here that I'm like, uh, why? Because I'm human. And she was human. And had been through all this, but what did she do? I'm going to walk in faith, even when my feelings don't match. Can you walk in faith when your feelings don't match? And then finally, number three. So we face the spiritual battle. Face the past with righteous action. And number three. Face your fears with faith. I want to pray for this. I think her name is Doran. I'm probably pronouncing that wrong. Who just sent in a request for prayer. She said that her mom was diagnosed with brain cancer. And is on hospice right now. So we're going to pray for their family right now. Father, we pray for Duran and her family right now. We pray first of all that she would know you. And know your presence now. Lord, I pray for her family. We'd love you to heal her. And to touch her. Whatever that means, Father. We pray that you would do that. And we pray that you'd be with them right now. In Jesus' name. Amen. Holly, good to see you watching with us. Mark 5. We pick up in verse 35. It says, while Jesus was still speaking. I love this. Jesus gets interrupted all the time. You ever get interrupted and it aggravates you? Yeah. Jesus' whole ministry was interruptions. All the time. All the, I don't even like catching red lights on the way here. I'm on the way to church and I'm like, oh, red light. That's how spiritual I am. Jesus gets interrupted all the time and he's like, well, that's just what I'm supposed to do next. When Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. By the way, Jairus earlier in this chapter had begged Jesus to come. And Jesus said, eh, I got things to do. But, you know, he just stay with us. And so he, Jairus kept following him around. And then her daughter, his daughter's dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. So these people came up to Jairus and said, listen, your daughter's dead. Leave Jesus alone and let's go home. Just give up. Just give up. But he was going to face his fears. 
That's what Jesus told them to do. And then a few verses later, they go to the house. When he went in and he said to them, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep, but they laughed at him. Now, what you don't know is, and it still goes on in China and a few other countries, they actually paid mourners back then to come to your house and mourn. By the way, did you know that I can hire actors to come to our church to worship? Did you know that? You can pay actors. They're not even Christians. They will come to your church and worship and make it look like everyone. So like when I'm talking, they'll be the ones who go, Amen, that's great, Pastor. What a great word. During the music, Dave, no matter, no matter how the music's going, they'll be going, Oh, praise Jesus, right in the middle. <laughs> he wants the price, if you couldn't hear online. But they really do. Isn't that funny? So you could get people to come in. It's like the Beatles used to do. Did you know the Beatles used to pay girls? Initially, they paid girls to scream, and then it became natural for girls to scream. Did you know that? So isn't that interesting? And so, so what is this? This is they paid them to mourn. So they'd come to your house. I'm so sad. How do I know they weren't really sad? Because as soon as Jesus said she's going to be okay, they went, hey, man, we've been here crying for days. You don't even know. The child's not dead, but asleep, but they laughed at him. After he put them all out, I love that. I love to see Jesus putting people out. Can you see? I mean, I don't know how that went. How did that go? I mean, he did a whip in the temple. Did he bring a whip back out? I'm not sure. Did he kick them? Did he push them? He got them all out. We're not sure. I would like to re-see that one. That would be good. We need a little more description there. When he went to where the child was, he took the baby, the, the girl by the hand, and he said to her, Talitha kum which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. And then he gave strict orders not to let anybody know about this. And he told them, give her something to eat. I love that. That just totally relates to me. Give her something to eat. You're going to have situations in your life where you're praying for somebody else where you're praying for God to do something in their life. Now, I'll be honest with you. You look in Scripture, and there's times that even Jesus' cousin passed away. Even Jesus' friends passed away. There were times, and almost all the disciples were martyred. There are times that it's just time to go. But there's also times where God brings healing. And so how do you pray? You pray that God would bring healing. And I usually pray that God would bring healing no matter what. And here's how I pray. God, would you heal them of their cancer? And what I'm saying in my heart is, God, either heal them here or release them to heaven. Sometimes when I pray for people and they are suffering and hurting, I say, God, would you just let them go? God, would you allow them to go home? And then other times I go in and pray for people. I'll never forget specifically one guy. I walked into his room to pray for him. And he sat up. He said, Eric Brookins, what are you doing here? His name is Dickie Duttenhaver, if you want to check my story. He said, Eric Brookins, what are you doing here? His daughter looked at me and went, oh! I said, what? She said, he's not supposed to wake up. I played golf with him six months later. You never know when you pray for somebody what God's going to do. Now, I've also prayed for people that God would just give them peace as they go. And guess what? They're healed too. I know where they are. They're rejoicing in heaven. I know that right now, Harold Brantley is in heaven with a full mind and a full heart and probably thinking, Eric, you should tell better jokes on the weekends. So your last prayer is this. Father, help me to walk in faith, not fear today. I want to encourage you to not just face one battle, but face all three. Face the spiritual battle. Face the past. I don't know who's hurt you in your life. Forgive. I don't know what's holding you back from doing what's next, something that happened in your past. Hey, it's time to release that and trust God. And then finally, I don't know what's dealing with you in your life that you're afraid of. Maybe it's you're praying for a friend. Maybe it's a family member. Maybe it's somebody that's hurting. Maybe it's something in your life. I want to encourage you, face fear with faith. I'll tell you what I prayed in the hospital. I remember being in the hospital and the doctor pretty much told me, I'm not sure you're going to get better. And I said, well, Lord, I'm your vessel. So if you want to put me on the shelf and not use me anymore, 
that's up to you. If you can use me on the shelf, that's fine. But Lord, if you want to use me and keep me walking around like I am right now, then that's okay too. But God, I trust you. And can I tell you, I didn't worry anymore. I thought, well, if I go see Jesus, I'll go see Jesus. Now, I might have been on some really good medicine at the time too. I can't promise that I wasn't. And yet, there was something in my heart that changed drastically at that moment because I said, God, I'm not in control. I'm helpless. But I trust you. Can you do that tonight? Can you do that today wherever you're watching? The first step to becoming a Christian is that same thing. It's surrender. It's Jesus. I can't do life on my own. I can't overcome my sin. I'm a sinner. I'm a failure. I can't get things right. I surrender my life to you. Why? Because I know Jesus died and rose again to pay for my sins. So I surrender my life to you. That's what it means to be a Christian. So if you want to do that today or tonight or whenever you're watching, you can do that right where you are. And then send me a note. Let me talk to you. Let me send you some follow-up information to help you take those next steps. Let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight as we close. Father, thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for your power. Lord, I pray you'd give us discernment to know when we're in a spiritual battle, to know even how to pray. Lord, you said you'd show us how to pray. And Father, sometimes we just need to know how to pray. And Father, I know sometimes we just need to be silent in prayer. Lord, I pray also that through gratitude, through praise, that we would realize that's a weapon that pushes the enemy away as we fret, as we worry, when we praise and thank you. So help us to walk in your power. Lord, I pray too, when we walk in fear, that you'd remind us to trust you. So Lord, we do that right now. We trust you with all that we have, with all you've given us. In Jesus' name, amen. I know that when you trust 